Hello and welcome to a new episode of Human Progress Podcast. Recently, I posted a number of articles about the dramatically declining prices of food in the United States over the last 100 years. And a couple of my correspondents complained that food today is less healthy, leads to obesity and has lower nutritional value than was the case in the past. So to set the matters straight, I'm absolutely delighted to speak to a celebrated historian of food and cooking, Rachel Loudon, whose book, Cuisine and Empire, Cooking in World History, came out in 2013 to much acclaim. So with that, Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much. So let me start by saying that Cuisine and Empire is really a masterpiece. Um, your ability to wed together uh, history, economics, politics, culture uh, is amongst the most impressive that, that I have read. And I want to get to nutrition, obesity and uh, quality of food uh, toward the end of the podcast. But I, I don't think it, may, it makes much sense uh, to talk about food and cooking today um, without first considering food and cooking in the past. Uh, so in other words, I think that to evaluate food and cooking today, uh, we have to compare it with food and cooking in history um, and, and see if there was progress rather than to compare food and cooking to some sort of an idealized, um, uh, idealized image or idea in the future. So let me start um, by with, with a subject that sort of permeates your book, and that is the distinction between humble and high cuisine uh, from the antiquity to the pre-modern era. And perhaps we can focus on Western Europe and its offshoots. So what did people eat and how was their food prepared? Okay, uh, let me start with cuisine because um, that can be a stumbling block for some people, the word cuisine. Um, I use it simply in its original uh, French sense as a style of cooking. Uh, we don't have a word for a style of cooking and eating in English. And uh, I want to trace uh, long-term uh, trends and changes in styles of cooking and eating. And so I call these cuisines. Sometime in the past, um, probably uh, ar around the time of the first states, uh, you get a division in many parts of the world between what I call high cuisines, that's the sense that people are more familiar with, and humble cuisines. And I call them humble because they are uh, not extravagant, but they are not necessarily uh, bad, either in terms of taste or in terms of nutrition or in terms of their inventiveness. Um, so high cuisines are ones we're familiar with, in fact, Everybody today, more or less in the United States, everybody who's listening to you and this pod podcast is going to be eating essentially a high cuisine uh, with a few modifications we'll get to later. A high cuisine has plentiful meat. The carbohydrate is one of the um, preferred carbohydrates, usually white rice or in the West, uh, white bread or pasta, same thing, uh, sweeteners, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, exotic foods from other places, spices, for example. Uh, those are the ingredients. They are usually in traditional high cuisines prepared by men in uh, special kitchens. And when they are eaten, they are usually eaten in a specialized place with specialized equipment, such as the knives and forks and plates and cups and saucers we know today. Um, those were, that was the lot of perhaps 10% of most societies um, in the last several millennia. Um, most people did not eat this. Most people ate humble cuisine. Um, this consisted largely 
of the less preferred carbohydrates, um, barley or oats instead, or millet instead of wheat or rice. Um, it had uh, very little in the way of meat, fat, sugar, or exotic goods. Um, it was prepared in the home by women in a room that was not specialized to cooking. And it was usually eaten from a common bowl with uh, your hands, with your fingers. So that's the distinction between uh, high and humble cuisines that dominated food history from at least say 3000 BC up until um, 1800 in the richer parts of the world, 1900 um, or later in poorer parts of the world. And just to be clear, um, preparation of food, of humble cuisine, uh, didn't just mean going into the garden, picking up a few carrots or something like that, throwing them in the pot and off it went. I mean, preparation of food, uh, the way I understand it in your book, uh, was quite a, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a process, quite a, uh, quite a physically demanding process, not least it because wasn't... of water and things like that. Yeah, well, you had to collect the firewood, you had to carry the water. I mean, this was still going on it still is going on in rural parts of the world. It was still going on when I lived in Mexico um, in the 1990s in rural Mexico, not in urban Mexico. Um, the uh, distinguished uh, archeologist Gordon Hillman who taught at the University of London um, did some studies on what it took to get wheat from harvest to being ready to grind into flour. There were 20 steps just to get from harvested wheat to uh, being able, wheat that was clean and um, had all its outer coverings removed so that you could grind it into flour. The grinding, the grinding is just extraordinary. It's been sort of written out of history, I think, because maybe it was women's work. I had the luck when I was in Mexico in the 90s, where there were still women who ground to get them to teach me to grind. If you are grinding on a simple grindstone, that is a rectangular slab of rock with a, um, a, a kind of uh, cylindrical uh, piece of rock to do the grinding. It takes you an hour to grind for one member of the family for one day's food. So if you've got a five member family, you're spending five hours on your knees grinding. That's and extraordinary. That, That's unbelievable. It's extraordinarily hard work. Only Olympic rowers have upper body strength. Um, that is equivalent to what archaeologists have discovered by looking at muscle attachments was the upper body strength of grinders. Right. So production of a humble meal would involve obviously a year long or season long hard labor by a man, presumably in the fields doing what farmers do, and then presumably an entire days of work by the woman to do everything from grinding to bringing water just to be able to produce a meal for her family. So, yes. Yeah. And I mean, one reason I wrote Quizzy, one of many reasons was to draw attention to the fact that although there's been a huge amount written about the history of farming, and although the standard line is once we go to what is commonly called the agricultural revolution or the agricultural transition um, of the Neolithic period, that you know, farm now the happy life of the hunter-gatherer is gone, and we have these poor farmers laboring away. The poor farmers, well, they were sometimes women too, but the labor that happened after the harvest gate and before the plate 
was greater than the work of farming. Farming is terribly hard work during harvest. It's very hard work during plowing there or uh, planting. There is weeding and things in between, but it goes up and down. The work of actually turning the grain, and it's always grain um, or roots that provide the basic carbohydrates, the work of preparing that after they've been harvested is more than the work of farming. So in many ways, life becomes harder when we stop uh, hunting and gathering, uh, moving around, uh, searching for roots and mushrooms and whatever along the way, killing animals. We settle down in these cities and become agriculturalists. And yet we stick with it, even though life is difficult. Why did we stick with it? Uh it is now, I mean, it's been very popular in anthropology in the last 30 or 40 years to say that it was much harder once we had moved away from hunting and gathering. I'm not sure it was. Um, I'm not sure that the studies of hunting and gathering that we have include all the work, the most classic study um, done on um, the... Uh, what used to be called the Bushman people in South Africa left out food preparation. So, <laughs> I see. It, it's, uh, I, so, but even so, why do we keep on with with grains? Nobody's found anything, any plant that is as amazing as the grains. I mean, don't forget when we go to grains. Um, we have had uh, 20, 50,000 years, more than that, of inventorying the plant resources of the planet. And so we're not novices. We have tried everything. Now, what do grains do? Grains um, are um, very high uh, in their nutritional density compared to their weight. So they can be transported. They are an almost complete food. They are dry, so they store well. And if you've got grains, you can turn grains into bread or let's just take wheat for a second. You can turn it into bread or pasta. You can turn it into sugar like malt sugar that the Chinese use. You can extract oil from many of the grains. You can turn them into condiments like soy sauce, and you can turn them into alcoholic beverages. I mean- That's important. That's very important. You can have a whole cuisine just based on, you, you've got your carb, you've got your fat, you've got your protein, you've got, in fact, um, I, I think I read somewhere, or maybe I heard it in one of the podcasts, that uh, there is some research trying to argue that the reason why we uh, became agriculturalists was precisely so that we could have access to beer and alcohol um, rather, than, rather than a stable supply of food. I don't know if this is a widely accepted hypothesis, but I know that it's floating about. It is so entrancing that it keeps popping up all the time. <laughs> okay. So I actually the, think it's probably more that by the time they, they're making alcohol, they are, they've done everything with grains and they've discovered that there's this wonderful range of foods you can make out of one part of one plant. So we have this emergence of humble versus high cuisine. So how did that distinction uh, emerge? And uh, what were its political, cultural, and religious origins and justifications? Um, you know, what was it about the agricultural societies that lead to the emergence of hierarchic, hierarchical? I can't pronounce that word. Hierarchical <laughs> eating. It's a terrible word. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can store grains for a long time. This means they become a source. Of, you can store them for, for most of them up for, for two or three years without a huge amount of loss. Um, pretty big loss, but still, they're there. Um, this means you've got a source of wealth, and whoever can sit on that wealth is going to be uh, able to exert power over others. Uh, because you're holding 
the thing that keeps people alive. Um, what you find in all ancient societies... Forgive me, it... um, forgive me. I, I, I just want to make something clear to our listeners. Um, by sitting on wells like grains, for example, it doesn't mean that you had to acquire it through nefarious means. Maybe you are just a better farmer or a better businessman and you end up with more stuff than, than others do, right? Yes, though it is true that in most ancient, I mean, the, the storage of grains is the storage of what is called surplus. And um, one distinguished historian said you shouldn't think of surplus as something that there's plenty of out there, that as soon as these hierarchical societies get established, um, they go out and they take everything. The great Roman doctor Galen in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire said, you know, the cities go out and they take everything they can from the peasants in the countryside, short of starving them. Mm -hmm. So there is an element, I think, of compulsion there. Um, and, I mean, it would be lovely if, if there weren't, but there is. Um, the individual, it's not the individual, it's more a collective store, I think. Um, being a better farmer is not going to give you enough, I don't think, to give you a great deal of power. Um, okay, anyway, well, it's... Good to be corrected on that. Uh, well, I... I, 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 I uh, that's just my sense. I mean, we're talking about periods in which there is very little written. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Chinese refer to people in the cities as the big rats who take their grains as compared to the little rats, which are the four-legged rats that get into the granaries. Um, Sorry, I, I, I interrupted you there. You were about to talk about the origins of high and uh, low cuisine uh, in terms of ancient societies. Um, yes. Um, e e around the globe where this develops, you find that people adhere to what I call a principle of hierarchy. And that is that each living kind of living being has a lifestyle, including um, its food, that is appropriate to it. So that, um, and everything is living from stones to the deities or the spirits or the unknown, unseen world that most people believe in. The stones which are living, um, they only need water to grow, like you see crystals growing in water, and they stay static. Plants need soil and sun and water. Animals need plants and soil and sun and, water, and so on up the hierarchy, so that um, humans are the ones, uh, civilized humans need grains. Um, that is... Uh, civilized in the traditional sense of simply living in cities, those human societies that have cities are grain based. Um, but within those cities, um, there is again a hierarchy. Um, the poor will eat the lesser kind of grains, the oats and barley, and the uh, elites will eat wheat. And the gods will get um, offerings of um, smoke rising up or aromas rising up from sacrificed meat and grains. Um, and that so we have a complete hierarchy of foods for a complete hierarchy of people. And I mean, the kicker in this is, of course, um, it goes along with a kind of what I call dietary determinism so that people really do believe you are what you eat, so that if you eat like animals standing up and eat raw foods, you will become like an animal. If you're a prince and you start eating lesser grains, you will become like a peasant. It goes the other way too. Fascinating. And so, okay, so with the emergence of cities, civilization uh, as life in the cities plus writing, 
um, with the emergence of this of this agricultural society, we have an emergence of hierarchy, and basically, what you eat is uh, hierarchized in the same way as power relations within 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 that structure. And of course, there are penalties for breaking with the hierarchy. So, for example, I was struck when you said that women in Hawaii could be punished by death by eating with their men. Right. And I think that also women in ancient Greece were not permitted to eat with men, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Certainly in Rome, they could. Yes. Um, uh, drinking, drinking wine for women was absolutely strictly pro prohibited in, in, in ancient Greece. That's for sure. I don't know about eating. Yeah. No, I mean, there are uh it varies from society to society but our idea that the whole family or the whole society will sit down and eat the same kind of thing was absolutely not true fascinating so in the pre-modern era i'm talking about thousands of years since the birth of agriculture until let's say 1650 or so um what was the quality of food and access to food like so, you know, I studied classics, so I heard a lot about food adulteration um, back in ancient Rome and Greece. Um, lots of poisonings, lots of slave cooks were put to death because the party died, <laughs> even though it may have nothing to do with the slave cook. It may have to do with some, some uh, extraneous force. Um, you know, we hear about monotony of diets in the ancient world, insecurity of food supply, hunger, starvation. Um, uh, not to hear about, not, not to not to talk about the, the, the lack of hygiene. So, um, once again, uh, what was the quality and access to food like, say, in the pre-modern era? And let's start with the poor. Okay. Because they constitute they constitute the ninety percent of humanity. Right. Uh, <laughs> I want to give a qualified kind of defense of the food of the poor because um, it wasn't necessarily terrible. Um, when I lived in Mexico, which you know, was an eye opener in many ways um, with respect to the history of food, the basic food there is the maize, the corn tortilla, the flatbread. Nobody, in a, if you eat a two pounds of tortillas a day, you're pretty fussy about the quality of those tortillas. And the tortillas made by women in the country were fantastic in terms of quality and taste and cleanliness. You could not buy, the richest person in the city could not buy a tortilla of that quality. We cannot buy a tortilla of that quality because today the tortilla is just a wrap that you put other things in. We don't depend, it doesn't matter to it. Like the bread is just a wrap for a sandwich. Um, it's what goes in that counts. But so it is true that the food of the poor uh, could be incredibly ingenious, tasty and healthy. That said, it was drastically limited compared to what we have today. I mean, if you're eating, you know, two pounds of tortillas and beans and chiles, that's it every day. It wasn't necessarily perceived at the time as monotonous because there was no contrast to compare it with. But from our perspective, we would be horrified to have to eat something that that was limited, that was that limited. It's also the case that it was highly seasonal and that a lot of the problems of hunger were not necessarily starvation, but the problem of the months before the harvest comes in. So that in Northern Europe or um, North America, this would be uh, May, June, July. You've run out of your stores 
and you know the harvest is not in and the fruit summer fruits and vegetables don't come in till august those are the hungry months and those are the months when people really are short of food and where childhood stunting and that kind of you know where children don't get enough so they don't grow tall a lot of that is due to the seasonality of food um Another reason why there is so much um, talk of hunger is that uh, food is very heavy. And if you don't have water transport, if you don't have a Mediterranean Sea or a large river where you can take grains and other goods by water, um, you can only move your basic carbohydrate foods about 10 to 15 miles, because after that, the cost of transport becomes greater than the value of the food. So that you can have throughout most of history, one village having um, severe sh food shortages to the point of starvation, where another one 30 miles away is doing just fine but you can't move the food around. Fascinating. And if obviously if, if there is inclement weather, like uh, I believe in uh, mid uh, 14th century Europe and there are unseasonal, there's unseasonal cold uh, or, or too much rain. And then you have uh, really a, a failure of harvest, then that leads to actually starvation on a much larger scale, right? Right. right. There, is, there is no way around it. Um, you, you can't the, you can't bring in anything to, to deal with it okay and, and just to just to make clear even though those tortillas were exceptionally good and we can't even get them we are talking about a lifetime of eating tortillas right uh, right uh, but, yes. okay. so okay so uh, so good uh, I mean that, that's breakfast lunch and dinner you know 365 days a year for however long you live. Um, tell me a little bit about personal hygiene and things like that, because I, uh, reading Braudel, I learned that uh, um, in Europe, uh, uh, well, animal excrement being used for farming was obviously widespread throughout the world. But in, in China, you, for example, you also have human manure and that sort of thing. So um, how... Uh, and people obviously didn't know about germ theory and anything like that. So how widespread were things like gastrointestinal, um, um, uh, you know, diseases uh, arising from uh, unhealthy, either unhealthy food or just not washing and things like that? Incredibly difficult to pin down because, you know, we don't have the medical records, uh, at least until the Industrial Revolution. It's pretty clear that in uh, that's one respect in which city life, um, although you get better and more varied food in the cities, um, the downside is that the danger of things like gastrointestinal diseases is much, much greater in cities than it is in the country. Um, you're buying more food in the street. Um, you have more people on the same sources of water. You have a greater concentration of people um, so that the whole problem of waste disposal becomes more difficult. Um, my impression is that in the country where things are dispersed, um, it it wasn't too bad. It, it was the cities where this was really bad. Mm. But, Although in the country, no. people would still sleep with their animals and presumably even if they were far away from human waste, they would still, um, maybe fleas were a problem, rats were a problem and that sort of thing. Yes, and there are, there's transmission of the diseases backwards and forwards between animals and humans. Um, and it's certainly true that in Northern Europe, for example, you would sleep with animals during the winter <laughs> though when i hear see all the people today with all their dogs and cats piled on their beds i'm not sure that we move much on that but no uh... i mean you already mentioned that 90 percent of uh, humans uh, were peasants who grew their own food 
um, but but people who bought food in the cities, how much of their income was spent on food? Um, today, I think that in the United States, uh, we spend 9% of our disposable income on food. Can you give us a sense of how expensive food was in the past? Yeah. Here you are venturing into one of the most controverted questions, not just in history of food, but in in history, we really don't know very much um, about most of history. And even where we get good records, and I'm going to talk about Britain in the Industrial Revolution, um, it is an incredibly difficult thing to disentangle. Um, it's called the cost of living debate. I don't know if you've heard of the cost of living debate. We are in the middle of it here in the United States right now. Yeah. Well, if you go to the historical literature, the cost of living debate refers to the question, did the cost of living go up or down um, during the Industrial Revolution? Right. And I mean, there are literally thousands of articles on this. Um, I, it, because you're asking, I looked up an article that was written in uh, two years ago by a British historian trying to sort of make sense of the current state of thinking on this. And she wants to distinguish very sharply um, country people and city people and mining people, industrial people working in mining, people working in industry, people working in agriculture. The people working in um, mining um, are spending at least 50% um, of their income on food. The people working in industry are spending, um, oh, 40% at least, I mean, we get different figures for this, but it's always going to be much, and they're both spending much more than people in, less than people in the country. People in the country, are, um, they are getting, um, now let me just, uh, where do we go? Uh, they're getting, they're spending um, about 80% of their food, their money on food. Um, you know, because they're not by that stage, they're not growing food of their own, except maybe a few vegetables. Uh, so um, nowadays, I know that that 9% figure has to be broken down in rather the same way, um, because there are people who spend much more than 9% and people who spend much less than 9%. But I think overall, the percentage uh, spent on food, it has dramatically declined from city people in the mid 19th century. And and before then, I mean, if I recall Braudel um, um, arguing that uh, up to 80% of, I mean, he, he was looking at uh, Europe in the Middle Ages and his estimate was that uh, anywhere between 40 and 80 percent of, of oh, income yeah. was spent on on food depending on your social class and where you right. live on that sort of thing right. and most of it spread uh, most of it spent on bread i mean in other words oh, yeah. that's you know so again a monotony of a diet based on bread on which you were spending a hell of a lot of money yes i mean in britain if you're a agricultural worker in the 19th century uh you were spending uh, 60 or 70 percent of your income on bread. I grew up in a village uh, where they had set stones into the wall of the churchyard um, that gave the price of bread um, in different years. And in 1800, it was a certain price. And in 1801, it jumped about 30 percent. And, you know, this was such a tremendous and traumatic event that they put the price of bread in in the church wall now let me suggest something to you that you may disagree with but i think that actually in the united states the nine percent figure that is spent on average on average uh, on uh, 
on food is actually inflated by the fact that half of our food spending is in restaurants. So if you look at the lines of food consumed at home and food consumed out of home, they are actually they actually met now. In other words, 50 percent of what we spend is in restaurants and at home. And because restaurants meal, um, meals are much more expensive than they would be at home, we are artificially actually increasing the amount of food that we are spending, uh, the amount of income that we are spending on food. If every, every food was bought in Walmart or Whole Foods and then consumed at home, presumably the figure would be much lower than 9%. It would be lower. Um, again, you know, if restaurants include, I mean, it's away from home. Yes. <laughs> so you're not talking necessarily white table cloth restaurants here. Yes. I mean, we're talking McDonald's and, and Arby's and that kind of thing. Um, but it, no, it is. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, people in America just take it for granted now that you can eat out. I had a student say to me, when you were a student, did you enjoy exploring the restaurants in the town you lived in, at the university town in England? And I just looked at her. I mean, when I was a student, <laughs> You didn't go to restaurants. You didn't have a prayer of going to a restaurant. So when, yeah, when I was a, when I started at St Andrews in 1999 or 2000, I can't remember. Um, we had two restaurants. One was an Indian pizza place, and the other one was an, an, an um, sorry an Italian pizza place and an Indian place. So there were two restaurants. And so late at night, if if you were hungry, you went for a deep fried Mars bar. You know, yeah. yeah. washed down with an iron brew. So that was the extent of our culinary experiences back yeah. then. Um, so another controversial subject, forgive me for pushing you on controversial subjects, but if we can't do it here, where, where can we? So oh, sure. I'm, conf I'm confused about calorie intake. Uh, again, speaking for uh, about the people at the bottom of the income ladder, this is what interests me most is what what 90% of people who were the peasants lived on. So, uh, you know, we sort of tend to think about consumption of 2000 calories per person per day as the as the starvation level, anything much below that. And you are really pushing it, or at least that's how I understand it. But many historians, include your, including yourself, um, note in your work that, you know, a typical male worker would have consumed between three and 5000 calories per day. So is that really because of manual labor? In other words, um, in other words, that the problem here is manual labor. So even where um, calories rich diet is not enough to keep people alive or on the age of starvation. Yeah, I think it is manual labor. And I think people had an idea of um, or let me forgive me or let me rephrase that so what separates people from starvation and survival or even flourishing is not really the total amount of calories it's more calories adjusted for the amount of work that they have to work that day in order to produce the food for next day would that be correct i think, I think that's much more like it and um, I think, for example, that there were huge adjustments. It was very common, as I understand it, in medieval England um, and right up through the 19th century to kill an animal shortly before harvest um, because you knew that you were going to need um, uh, a better diet in order for the men to do the hard work of harvest. So that I think people's calorie consumption, I mean, now well, there's always food available. So we just sort of chug along and we can have as much as we like all the time. I think in the past, you know, going back to the hungry months, you know, the, the number of calories available were much lower, probably very often in, you know, the months before the harvest than they were um, after the harvest. Um, they, uh, some historians say that, you know, in very northern areas, the peasants essentially hibernated during the dark months of winter and sort of went to bed. And then your calorie needs go down dramatically. 
Um, and you get all kinds of reports from um, observers, and I've heard people themselves say this, that um, they adjust, that, that families did adjust the amount they ate in relation to the work they knew they were going to have to do. Um, so they would save up food for, you know, a family who would make sure the man, for example, if he were doing heavy work in early industrialization, he was a miner or a navvy or something like that, he would get some meat, the rest of the family would not, but he needed those extra calories from the meat and the fat. So um, I'm not sure a daily average is going to capture what's going on. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. And, and a good reminder that, that things don't necessarily go in a linear kind of fashion. I want to stick to meat just for a few more minutes. Would it be fair to say that uh, meat consumption, especially for the masses, was something special. I, I want to divide it into two or three different stages. One would be antiquity. So I assume that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the reason why they had all these religious festivals is because that's where the meat was slaughtered. And then after the offerings to the gods, it would be shared amongst the, the, the people. This This would be presumably one of the few uh, instances when uh, people would have access to meat. Is that correct interpretation of the literature? Yes. I mean, what we don't, don't, <sighs> what we don't have for say country people is how much they were able to get the odd rabbit or small bird or, you know, um, even the rat or something like that. Um, that's just not captured in uh, any records that we've got. Uh, certainly meat eating um, for citizens in the ancient world was um, a symbol of the, um, of the state, of the political unit. And if you take the Olympics, which as you as a classicist will know, were as much a religious ceremony as a sporting one, um, you know, there was um, a sacrifice at the end of the Olympics and 30 cattle were slaughtered and the meat was divided. I calculated it out once. It's not a huge amount of meat per person, but it is meat. Um, but of course, you know, that was for citizens. There weren't women there and there weren't slaves there. So um, how much people across the spectrum got, I am not sure, but I mean, nothing like our assumption that we will have meat at least once and probably two or three times a day. And then moving from antiquity to the modern era, I also read that uh, people had to be very careful about slaughtering their domestic animals. I once read that, for example, even something as simple as slaughtering of a chicken would have been uh, something reserved for special occasions, if at all, because you are essentially removing a source of food um, because yeah. if you kill the chicken, there is no more uh, eggs, eggs uh, right? Um, and, and and that is an extraordinary thing when you when you compare it to today, where a minimum wage in the United States is something like uh, seven and a half dollars and a Costco chicken, rotisserie chicken costs five dollars. Uh, so basically a person working on a minimum wage. And by the way, 90% of American workers get about $12 and up. So the, the, the people on 750 are really very few and in between. But for, for an hour of work, you get a, a, an entire chicken. So presumably something like that uh, would have been very difficult to come by before. When I was a child, a long time ago, back in the 1950s, ch chicken was the luxury meat. Really? Uh, Oh, yes. I still, when I see fried chicken, I mean, I forget hamburgers. I mean, you know, that still connotes luxury to me because it wasn't until you got the mass production of chicken that, uh, and the separation of the production of meat and eggs that chicken became uh, an everyday or even the cheapest meat. It's very, very recent.
out of interest, and, and this is something that's sort of tangential to our conversation, but do your students, presumably in their early 20s, uh, do they ever ask what, what was life like from a culinary or uh, food consumption experience when, when you were little? They don't. <laughs> Nobody believes you because it, it is so incomprehensible to a modern American, even the kind of food uh, um, that uh, the English had after World War II. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, no chicken, um, yes, meat, but small amounts, um, no going to restaurants, um, no foreign food. Um, it, it, it's, it's something, I think it's, uh, it's a loss of historical knowledge that makes it very hard to talk about food today because it's filled in with this romantic fairy tale story that, you know, you went out to the garden and you plucked your uh, carrots, as you said, or your peaches, and you killed your chicken, and it was abundant and healthful, and just it's been downhill ever since. Well, one of the things that absolutely blew me away in your book was that little statistic about 80% of Italians not being able to afford pasta in the 1930s. 1950s. In the 1950s. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe, you know, but maybe that's one of the reasons why we see so much anxiety and so much um, dissatisfaction uh, amongst the youth is because they have no historical perspective. They, they can't, cannot really appreciate what went on. But I mean, I know it from my own experience when my grandmother who grew up under, um, you know, um, under Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia was telling me about hunger, starvation. I mean, they were borderline starving at that time. Um, it just didn't register. It just was not something that you could process. Um, no, it, it, it's not a, a failure on any on their part. I mean, it's just so far outside experience. Yeah, and that, that's why she would always insist, you know, you have to eat absolutely everything because, you know, you never know when you might be starving. And yeah, you just don't get it. And then by the time that I started being interested in all of this stuff, of course, she was gone. So there was nobody to talk to. <laughs> but OK, moving on. So we have talked about um, we have talked about life for ordinary people. That's what we are mostly interested in um, in the pre-modern era. We have skipped the high cuisine because I think that Everybody can sort of understand what high cuisine is, um, what maybe was enjoyed by the top 5% of, of the population. You can now still find in French restaurants and things like that, but we don't need to talk about it. What, what I want to, I want to move to the, to, to, to the modern era, which really starts in the 17, 18 centuries. And I want to talk about, um, well, just when I thought I couldn't think any less of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his and his role on, in, in uh, human history, you pointed out in the book that it was Rousseau who started the whole natural food movement uh, in his influential work, Emile. Um, my understanding is that uh, humans had been toying with nature for a long time through selective breeding, for example. So is there any fundamental difference uh, between artificial selection um, of plants and um, meats uh, through breeding and crossbreeding and uh, GMOs, for example? Uh, not from my perspective. And I think it's interesting that since you're a classicist in the ancient world, um, cultivation um, was seen as um, a form of uh, food processing or preparation that you did want to uh, modify the plants that you had to make them better. Um, so uh, yes, uh, you know, modification of plants goes way back every time archaeologists look at it, it goes further back. Um, and I would see um, GMOs and other modern technologies as an extension of that. Right. So people should understand that what we look at as a corn today or a 
tomato or uh, a carrot didn't look anything like that in the past it's it, it's a product okay so so you walk into whole foods and you pick up a nice carrot or or i don't know a piece of corn and you think and, and it's got an organic label on it and you think oh my god i'm getting as close to nature as possible but in fact it didn't look like it before humans no interfered with it. no i mean and some of them didn't even exist at all i mean maize just didn't exist before humans got going on it um so and and luckily this is one of the points that is fairly easy to get across to people because you can show them pictures of what things used to look like and what they're like today and the pictures are worth a thousand words i guess so rousseau to whom I referred in my previous question, brings us to the Enlightenment. And you argue that basically that period of time in European history was as fundamental of a change as um, the discovery of agriculture 12,000 years ago. Um, and basically that during this time we have an emergence of a new cuisine and that's the middling cuisine. So, so far we've been talking about the high cuisine and the humble cuisine and now we have the emergence of a middling cuisine. So what is it and where did it come from? I think you get from both a uh, religious and a political aspect, and of course they're tightly tied in together since uh, states sponsor religions, um, a, a, a criticism of the hierarchical principle. Um, when you get Protestantism, um, the whole idea of the Catholic mass with the priest performing and the recipients is replaced by the idea um, in Lutheranism and other Protestant religions of communicants uh, around a table and them having um, equal access. Uh, the, a lot of food historians have pointed out that the royal banquet and the Catholic mass had a lot of um, parallels and that this was not accident. The way the table was laid out, the important place of uh, wine and fine cups, the processional aspects, so that um, in uh, traditional um, Catholic states of Europe, uh, the uh, not it was not just that um, church and state were linked in multiple ways, but that link was demonstrated in in the the feeding both in the mass and in the uh, royal banquet. That all goes out with Protestantism. Um, and at the same time, you get the development of uh, Republican and liberal theories of politics, um, uh, an argument for separation of church and state. And I think um, the Dutch Republic is particularly important here, the Dutch Republic of the 17th century, where the Dutch quite deliberately reject um, the high cuisine in favor of a middle-class bourgeois cuisine, family-based, equal for all, um, without the extravagance of high cuisine. So this is, I, I found, the entire book fascinating but this part is really the most interesting to me because essentially um you are tying the emergence of enlightenment protestantism equality before the law questions surrounding the ruling class legitimacy with food and how politics and different changing ideas about politics impact how we eat and this is really the break with the past. So the Enlightenment is a break with the past along so many dimensions that, that, that had been covered elsewhere. But here you are saying it's fundamental also to food consumption. I think so. And I mean, let me turn to the 
United States or the young republic of the United States at the end of this century. Uh, just two things that, that, well, actually one in the 19th century. When um, the United States declares itself um, independent, one of the questions they have to address is what they do about diplomacy. Because the diplomatic meal, which is central to diplomacy, is an aristocratic meal with high cuisine. And it's very much like the royal banquet or the mass. I mean, it's elitist and extravagant and, you know, have to have tons of special china for it. And the Americans say that they will not hold they will not um, uh, give their diplomats the go ahead to indulge in these meals. And it has been a problem for Americans ever since to know what to do about the proper meal, the, the state meal in America, because should they join the international community and have high French cuisine, uh, say under the Reagans, or should they uh, simply have a more democratic meal, um, barbecue under President Johnson, for example, um, when uh, George the Sixth goes to America to meet Roosevelt, he is served a hot dog and he has to eat it with his fingers, you know. So in America, this is right at the center of um, state and individual politics. The Thanksgiving meal was specifically designed in the United States to be a Republican meal. It was designed to be a family meal with affordable ingredients that everybody could have. So you have sweet potato pie and you have pecan pie and you have, you know, everyday vegetables. Um, and it was a you know, this happened immediately after the Civil War, um, the construction of the Thanksgiving meal, um, so that it's not, uh, it's acted out in all, I, I heard a fascinating talk by um, an Irish food historian about what the Irish did, Southern Irish, after they got independence from the British and they declared the Irish Republic. They went through the same routine. We can't do the diplomatic meal. We are not going to buy, spend thousands of pounds on uh, fancy China for the diplomatic meal because republics don't do that. Yeah, and, and I'm about to make a political point, so don't feel... Um, obliged to, to respond to it. But in my view, as the American presidency has grown more imperial and loyal in all of its royal, in all of its accoutrements, um, we have seen increasingly presidents having fewer problems, I think, with putting on lavish displays of wealth and power. I mean, you noted in your book that Nancy Reagan bought very expensive China for which she was criticized. But then the Clintons had their own China and the Obamas bought their own China. And uh, uh, of course, all of them have given a massive and very lavish uh, entertainment for, for uh, foreign visitors. Yeah. Well, it's difficult. I mean, you know, it's a, it is a tricky problem in the sense that do, how do you relate to the international community? And I can see there are, are, are difficulties there. Um, one aspect of liberalism that emerges in 18th century is, of course, free trade. And um, I was particularly pleased to see in your book that you do discuss free trade and its impact on uh, on food prices and uh, types of eating in uh, in in Europe, especially Britain, with which you are most uh, most familiar. So can you talk about a little bit about the importance of the Corn Laws and their effect on the welfare of the British public? Sure, the Corn Laws were a set of tariffs on imported, uh, let's call it grain or wheat, because corn in America specifically means maize. Um, so it was, uh, uh, it protected British landowners and British farmers. They had guaranteed prices and foreign grain couldn't come in. Um, as um, 
in um, urbanization and industrialization occurred, um, this kept the price of food relatively high for, or high for the urban populations, well, actually the rural ones too, by that stage. And so when the corn laws were repealed, um, the effect, not immediate, but after about 30 years was that um, wheat from America began to come into the United States, into Britain, and it dramatically uh, reduced the cost of food. Um, the continental countries, Germany and France, decided to protect their agricultural industries by keeping the tariffs on and in fact increasing them. Um, it's a really, really, I mean, it, I, I am basically pro free trade. I can see there's a downside to it. Britain became so dependent on foreign food that when World War II and World War I, three, World War I and World War II came along, we're maybe up for three soon, um, you know, it, it, if America had not come to the rescue and shipped food across the Atlantic, there would have been mass starvation in Great Britain. And much of the common agricultural policy was put in place by the European Union in, in order to make sure that the starvation of World War II did not recur in that area. Um, so on the one hand, uh, you know, free trade work real I mean it was great for Britain it was great for British workers it works really well until the politics changes and you're at war yeah I mean this is a point I make all the time we are making a lot of progress but nothing is guaranteed because if politicians decide to ruin it for the rest of us they can certainly do good do yeah. a very good job yeah. at it. I mean, but I, I just want to emphasize uh, for the listeners that the chapter where you combine the rise of liberalism, Protestantism, Enlightenment, um, the emphasis on uh, on on uh, equality before the law, um, and 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 that you know I've been long arguing that this is the great break from the drudgery of the past, but it actually does have serious culinary consequences, which you in fact call the triumph of the middling cuisine between uh, 1820 and 1910. Uh, what do you mean by the triumph of the well, middling I mean, it, it, Not, not it, only does it appear on the horizon, but it takes over the world, right? Well, yes. I mean, what uh, I, I, one thing, a uh, way of looking at it is that as the franchise extends, um, you cannot I mean, there is a parallel between greater access to better and more various food at a reasonable price and the spread of the franchise. Because if you're gonna be a citizen, um, you can't be cut out. If you're gonna be an equal citizen, equal before the law, as you say, you have to have equal access to food. It's not actually written out like that, but that's the kind of underlying logic. Um, yes, it. I mean, and you know, it may start, it, it, it's, yeah, it takes, it's everywhere. Um, it's not just a European story. The same thing is happening um, in Japan. Um, it is at least being debated. Um, the same thing is happening in Russia, of course. Um, it goes slightly different way because of socialism. But I mean, again, it, it, Socialism is, it didn't always work out as expected, but it was an attack on the aristocratic system. Yes. Um, and um, so you, you have in multiple different places, you get the same thing happening in the Ottoman Empire, in the Middle East, um, you get it debated by um, Indians who are in the independence movement. Um, in India, um, everywhere, it is seen that um, breaking down this old aristocratic 
division between high and humble cuisines is part of becoming a modern state. Um, what are the features of uh, the middling cuisine? And obviously, um, it is coterminous with food processing and uh, industrialization and the decline of prices. Um, so maybe we can talk just a little bit about food processing, um, the fall in the price of food, and um, and how does that translate into into what people eat on on daily basis? Just very briefly. Well, I mean, uh, food has always been processed, but what happens in the 19th century is that animal labor, including human labor, and wind and water as sources of power are replaced by fossil fuels as sources of power. And that means things like grinding, um, which we keep returning to bread as being so central, um, bread, pasta, uh, cookies, the whole lot, uh, uh, I mean, crackers, you move from a human grinding takes five hours a day for a family. A water mill can do it in 15 minutes a day for a family. A big powered steel roller mill up in um, the Midwest in Minneapolis you only need a dozen of those in the United States. And so the flat, the, the, the steel roller mill is invented around 1875 by 1900. You have them, it was invented actually in um, the Austro-Hungarian empire, which is part of your world perhaps. Um, so it spreads to the United States and England France, the whole of Europe, um, Latin America, you've got the wrong brothers in China putting them in, you've got them in India. I mean, it transforms food for the world because the labor of grinding is, is reduced to moments um, with fossil fuel power. And so the price of, um, you've still got the price of growing wheat uh, for bread, but you've got at this, I mean, a lot of things are going on at once. You've got fossil fuel um, applied to the processing of grains. You have got fossil fuel applied to the transport of grains because you've got steamboats and railroads so that that old 10, 15 mile limit on how far you can take grains is gone. You can take them wherever you want at essentially a tiny price. And you have got the opening up for better or worse of the grasslands of the world in the Western United States and Canada, in um, uh, 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 Brazil and Argentina, in New Zealand and uh, Australia. And so, um, you've got a lot more land to grow those grains. And a little bit later, obviously, fossil fuels go very much into the production of, uh, of artificial uh, fertilizer, um, yeah. right? And, uh, and of course... And that power... improves productivity, yeah. And, and, and powering of tractors and uh, right. things like that. Um, so it's a positive... I mean, it's what the historian... Um, Tony Wrigley at Cambridge called the organic, a change from the organic economy to the industrial one. And, um, you know, it affects food as much as it affects everything else, probably more. Right. And so this, again, contributes massively to the decrease in uh, food prices. And as you describe in your book, by the early 20th century, beef and bread becomes an obsession in uh, the United Kingdom. And as the British Empire grows, other countries are beginning to wonder why are the Brits so successful? Well, it must be the diet. Therefore, let's all eat bread and beef, right? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, more recently, we have seen a renewed interest in anti-processing of food, localism, naturalism, uh, or, um, organics, so 
that brings us to the quality of food and nutritional content of food today. I promised when we started this podcast that we would get back to it. So in a word, is food better today than 100 or 200 years ago or is it worse? Yes, better. Better? Better, 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 better. Is it all good? No, of course not. Humans are, you know, <laughs> are humans. Um, uh, it's not all nutritionally wonderful it's not all uh what uh many people would like to see it to be but in terms of its abundance its safety um the access of wide numbers of people to nutritionally ad adequate food um oh it's in i mean it, it, it's night and day. Who would you recommend that people read for this particular subject? What book or what study? Um, anything out there? Aside, good... aside from obviously Cuisine and Empire. Cuisine and Empire. Uh, I think we're waiting for a book that is written with the romantic verve of Michael Pollan's um, books. Um, um, people, uh, for whatever reason, um, yeah, I think I know what, I mean, they yearn for the Rousseau vision of the fresh and the natural and the rural and there have been many people writing about the virtues of modern food, but it's a hard sell because they, it's not poetic enough. It's not, it's not an escape. It's not, it's saying it's okay. What you've got there in the grocery store is, is okay. In fact, it's better than, you know, Goodness, I mean, you know, if Louis the Fourteenth saw it, he wouldn't know what to do. Um, he'd be so overwhelmed by what you can get in your local Kroger. Um, that's not what people want to hear. Um, they they imagine. I, I don't know why, and you know, um, they see. I, I, we're in a very funny state because the changes in the last hundred years are the biggest changes um, in food and probably in human lifestyle in at least um, 10,000 or 20,000 years. And uh, at least for the time being, and at least in the West, we are, uh, and in, you know, many other places as well um you know i don't want to make this just a western story it's true of japan true of many people in china now too re very recently there's an abundance and we have abundant everything and it's patently clear that we've got to relearn lots of habits to deal with abundance i mean there's the obesity question um which i think is basically an abundance problem how it traditionally what you could eat was so constrained by um shortage that all most of our social mores are designed to give us when we get the chance to eat as much as possible so that all festivities involve large amounts of food um, and large amounts of food are good and that's you know a very good social programming for shortage and it's not such a good social programming for abundance it's equally clear you know i th i think there's a parallel between this and you have surely heard of the marie kondo decluttering kind of phenomenon i did not uh, please do tell me about you, it you don't know marie kondo and <laughs> decluttering well you know she tell she's a wrote a very successful tiny book about how to get your house clear of junk mm -hmm. 
because, you know, people are just overwhelmed by all the stuff in piles of magazines and, you know, enough clothes to see them till the end of time. It, it, and... it's, it's, it's the implication of what you are saying that in the past, everything was so scarce that it was that we have sort of built up, perhaps not genetically, because there wouldn't be enough time for, for genes to sort of change in the last, well, maybe there would, but certainly culturally, that we are so, um, uh, so, so shaped by our history that we just want more clothes and more food and grab onto anything we can get precisely because we didn't have it. So we are, we are driven by some sort of a subliminal reminder that, you know, this could be the last time that you're going to eat, therefore eat as much as you could possibly eat. Yeah, I, I think it's not just sort of a subliminal. I mean, this is just a guess. I yeah. mean, everybody's guessing about, you know, how, what is obesity and how do you deal with it? So I, I'm no, no more informed and probably less than many other people. But, you know, it's, as I said, it's built into language, into social customs, um, you know, uh, uh, Asian languages say, have you eaten today as a greeting? Oh, really? the yeah. The assumption being that, you know, well, eating is good. You must eat because you might not have eaten today. Uh, we have, as I just said, you know, a birthday party means lots of food and lots of sweets. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to, but it is. So that is... It's, I think it's a matter of trying maybe gradually, and I think it will take a long time to work out to get our social customs and language in line with this amazing abundance, assuming the amazing abundance continues. Yeah, it's actually come to think about it. Um... You know, I, I just recall from my youth how often my grandmother would start a conversation with what have I eaten or have I eaten? Yeah. Um, precisely because she remembered days when uh, when there was no food. So that's all very interesting. Um, recently, I was talking to a, uh, a, a professor um, of religion, um, Alan Levinovitz, who wrote a book called Natural. Um, and um, we talked also about Rousseau and we talked about... Um, um, about the myth of the noble savage. And we also hypothesized that, you know, it, it may be precisely with the decline of religion in the 18th century that, that you have a decline in a meta-narrative about what is a man's, man's and woman's place in the world. Because the religion gave you a clear indication of what your state was, where you were going, where you came from, and so on. And when that becomes less powerful, you need to develop a new narrative. And the, the genius, the evil genius of Rousseau, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, um, <laughs> is, is, to, is to offer a new meta-narrative, which is that of a noble savage who lives in uh, unity with nature, um, everything is abundant, and he is spoiled by civilization and basically the contemporary um, parts of the contemporary political scene are continuing to run with that myth. Yeah. yeah. You know? No, no, I, I, I know Alan well. Um, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> that's great. Okay, yeah. No, I, I think there's a lot to that. And, you know, I was just thinking the other day that I hadn't thought about the noble savage in quite the way I had until recently when I was thinking about the noble part of the savage, because this whole romantic movement in many ways always tends back to the old aristocratic with the hierarchies. Um, and of course the savage is noble. He is noble. And so he's in abundance and we're back, you know, it's a circle back. There are, I mean, all the um, people who are writing about food from the romantic, I mean, as far as I can see, you've got sort of four basic ways post enlightenment. There's the old aristocratic, there is the kind of liberal Republican tradition, there is the socialist 
tradition, and then you've got this romantic tradition. And the romantic tradition, uh, and none of them are pure and they all cross over and so on, but the romantic tradition always has this move because the only people who can go like Rousseau up into the mountains, I mean, you know, you're a person of leisure to be able to do that. Um, you are a person who can travel. You are a person um, who can escape the toiling masses back in the city. So yeah, I think, yeah, I, I would go along with that. So in this podcast, um, we have looked at food from the origin of um, history, written history, written records. Uh, we started with the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. We looked at uh, the hierarchical difference between uh, the humble and the high cuisine. Um, we talked about what lives of uh, ordinary people must have been like, what they ate, what they didn't eat. Um, then we talked about the massive break that comes in uh, food history with the rise of the Enlightenment and then uh, the Industrial Revolution food processing leading to abundance, which is on the whole good, as you say, good, good, good. It's just not perfect. And I would submit that perfection is uh, for the next life, <laughs> <laughs> but not for this one. This is where I always resort to the phrase that uh, today's problems are yesterday's solutions. Very good. This has been an absolute joy and uh, a privilege to speak to you. Thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure on my part too.